Okay, this section is about entropy mostly, and if we're talking about the randomness or the unorganization of a system, we're talking about entropy. And um, scientists use the letter um, S as a symbol for entropy, and there's usually a table of standard entropy values at the back of a chemistry textbook. And um, they'll give you the values for different substances, pure and chemical compounds. And um, basically, if somebody says that something is very, very organized, then it would have a lower entropy value. That means that there are fewer variations within that sample. Let's say it has fewer electrons. Therefore, there are fewer positions in space for those electrons to occupy. Therefore, it's more organized, so it has a lower entropy. They may also refer to the amount of randomness as the um, degrees of freedom that something might have. So if you have a compound or a molecule with a ton of bonds in it, you can twist around the bonds, which means the atoms would occupy different places in space, which means it would have more degrees of freedom. Okay? Now, lower entropies have fewer configurations or fewer positions in space that they can occupy, and we call stuff like that microstates. Okay, so the more positions something has um, to occupy, the more microstates it has. Think of it as if I take a bunch of clothes and I throw them across a room, that would be very disordered. That would have more microstates. That would be a higher entropy. Okay, okay, now let's come down here. And let's talk about how they define zero entropy. The third law of thermodynamics says, if you have a perfect crystal with really organized particles within it at zero Kelvin, that is considered zero entropy. So everything is measured from there. If I give you a table with a list of atoms, so here are the noble gases from helium down to xenon. Helium has the fewest electrons and therefore would be more ordered. So it's standard entropy. So do you see this little degree symbol in the upper right-hand corner of the S? This stands for standard. Standard conditions tend to be a certain temperature, a certain concentration, like one molar concentration, a certain pressure, like one atmosphere or sea level, um, a certain temperature, maybe like zero Kelvin. And you can see that helium has the lowest entropy value. Xenon has the highest. So you can either consider the atomic number or the number of electrons when you're thinking about what is going to vary the entropy for substances. Helium has got an atomic number of two. And then xenon has got an atomic number of 54. Okay, so... Obviously, there will be dramatic differences in the locations in space that the subatomic particles can occupy in helium versus xenon, okay? Let's take a look at the next page. As things get more complicated, so as you have like a basic nitrogen monoxide molecule versus a dinitrogen pentoxide molecule, obviously the entropies will be dramatically different. The simple molecule, NO, has got the lowest entropy, whereas the more complicated molecule has got the higher entropy because there are more bonds, there are more atoms. I can twist around those bonds and those atoms will occupy different spaces um, and lead to a higher entropy. Something else you need to consider with entropy is temperature. So the entropy of a substance is strongly dependent on temperature. That's because as temperature increases, kinetic energy or motion increases, particles move more chaotically, they collide more often, they move in different locations, and your entropy would also increase. Something else you need to consider is the physical state of something, okay? Obviously, solid particles will have minimal motion. They can only vibrate or oscillate in place. Here you can see that we've got solid iodine. Its entropy value is 116 versus gaseous iodine has over a double entropy value. And that's because gases have completely unrestricted motion and they would have more variability, more microstates. 
and that would lead to a higher entropy, okay? Let's take a look at chemical reactions. I'm gonna teach you a general way to predict whether entropy is increasing or decreasing for chemical reactions by looking at the number of gaseous particles available. This doesn't always work. It isn't always reliable. However, we're not gonna be using a table of entropy values, which is the most reliable way to do it. The entropy values will be listed underneath each substance in the balanced chemical equation to justify what I'm doing, but I'm just letting you know that if you dive further into chem, this won't always work, okay? Entropy usually decreases if gas particles combine into fewer particles. So let's take a look at this first reaction. I'm gonna highlight the states of matter and then I'm gonna write how many gases we have on each side. I have three and two. So the number of gas particles is decreasing. So the entropy will decrease, okay? Let's take a look at another example. I'm highlighting the gas in this second reaction. I have zero gases on the reactant side. I have one gas on the product side. So therefore, entropy will increase mainly because a gas is produced. Let's take a look at another example. Down here, I'm highlighting the gases. I have one on the reactant side, two on the product side. Entropy is increasing because one gas molecule becomes two. Easy? Okay. Now, sometimes the number of gas molecules doesn't change. If that happens, you want to count the number of atoms that are part of the gas molecules. So I'm gonna highlight the gases in this reaction. You will notice that we have three on the reactant side and three on the product side. So we have to count the number of atoms. I have three carbons here and six oxygen. So that means I have a total of nine atoms in the gas phase in CO2, okay? Over here, I've got three carbons and three oxygens. So that means I have six atoms in the gas phase in CO, okay? So you could predict that the entropy will decrease since you went from nine atoms in the gas phase to six, okay? Okay, let's take a look at chemical changes. If you have a closet and you have organized the shirts in your closet by color, let's say you had all the white shirts together and then all your colored shirts separate. That would be very ordered, that would be low entropy, okay? So think of it as you have taken a group of items and you've taken the common items and put them together. Your common items would be your white shirts and then your colored shirts, okay? so. If you take a look at a chemical reaction and you take a look at the nitrogen and oxygen atoms in this example. So here I've got my nitrogen atoms together and here I have my oxygen atoms together. They would have less entropy when they're together because they're more organized. But if I mix them together, then my entropy would increase, okay? Go to the next page. Last example here. Entropy generally increases when the common items split up to form or be part of more groups. In this example, the entropy increases because the oxygen atoms are in carbon dioxide on the reactant side, and then they split up and now they're in carbon monoxide and water, okay? Now, because of the fact that we are not using actual reference values, I'm never gonna try and trick you, okay? These are super straightforward examples. So let's come down here and let's take a look at the practice problems. We wanna predict whether entropy increases or decreases. And if you look at number one, what would you predict would happen?
increases. Yeah, entropy increases because we're going from zero gases on the reactant side to one gas on the product side. Okay, number two, what would you predict? Decreases. Yeah, entropy increases because even though you have eight gases on each side, you've got 16 atoms in the gas phase on the reactant side, and then you have eight plus 16, so you have 24 atoms on the product side. Okay. Last one. Increases. We're melting ice. So because of the state of matter changing from a solid to a liquid, um, solids have restricted motion. They can only vibrate or oscillate in place. Liquids slide over each other. The entropy is increasing. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the next page and talk about um, the relationship between entropy and enthalpy. And that's the last part of this section. Okay. Generally speaking, enthalpy and entropy can influence an equilibrium's position. So we generally tend to drive towards a decrease in enthalpy, so that means a negative delta H would be preferred, and an increase in entropy, which would be a positive delta S. Okay? So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Let's come down here. In this reaction, we've got our delta H value inside of the equation. Okay, it's on the reactant side. So what that tells you is that negative delta H would be in the reverse direction, okay? Let's take a look at the states of matter for a second. I'm going to highlight all the gases, and we've got two gases on the reactant side and three gases on the product side. So doesn't that mean that in this direction we are increasing in entropy? Okay, so when you have opposing directions for a negative delta H and a positive delta S, that means at equilibrium, you will end up having a reasonable amount of both reactants and products present. Okay, if you take a look at the example on the right, I'm going to highlight my delta H value. And then I'm going to go ahead and highlight my gases. So here I've got three gases on the reactant side, two gases on the product side. So that means this reverse direction would be my positive delta S. And then exo is happening in the forward direction. So this direction would be my negative delta H. So we oppose directions for positive delta S and negative delta H. So that means in this example, we would also have a reasonable amount of reactants and products present. Let's take a look at the top of the next page. There are four scenarios, generally speaking, for stuff like this. And those four scenarios are given to you here. <clears throat> 